morning as the word come, comes forth, Father. God, that it would show us how to fight this morning. That it's not by our power, it's not by our might, but it's by when we lean into Jesus and His strength empowers us this morning, God. We ask with hands lifted high for the strength of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that motivated Jesus, the Spirit that showed up in Pentecost, that was dwelt with the apostles, that dwells with us now, God. Rest upon us in the here and now, Father. We thank you that we have power. We thank you, Father, that we have the energy of the Holy Spirit flowing within us here and now. Do what only you can do this moment. We are not here by accident. We are here on purpose. You have enlisted us into this army, into this war, and we are going to fight well. We are going to finish the race well. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you. You can be seated. Look at someone and say, I am victorious. You are victorious. This morning, this is a victorious church. And we are going to walk. Awesome. Well, we are uh, finishing up our series in Ephesians. I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed preaching it and just teaching it and studying it. It has blessed me and I pray uh, that it's blessed you. And a couple of new things, uh, if you pull out your smartphone, if you haven't already, download the Gathering Place Church app. There's uh, notes built in. There's a section on our new app. It says sermon notes. You can follow along. If you're a fill in blank person, this app is all for you. Uh, but it's a great way to stay engaged, fill in some blanks. And, uh, you know, what's amazing is we might not carry pen and paper, but the Holy Spirit still speaks. I believe he can speak to you personally a word that you need while we're discussing and just it's always good to jot it down. And the way it's set up, you can archive them, you can go back and revisit them, you can forward them to your spouse who should be here or your friend who should be here and uh, make sure that they're involved uh, in a part. So make sure you do that. Also before um, we jump into the word this morning, man, it's just been awesome seeing God open doors for this ministry, for this church, for our school. Uh, we are, are blessed to be able uh, to put uh, a great ad letting people know that our, our school's Zion Christian Academy is enrolling. Uh, and it's going to be in a, a publication that goes out in the mail. Thousands of homes get it. Uh, so we're believing that this is going to cause great growth in our school, get the word out. Uh, we had a, a parent, they just uh, moved into town looking for schools, got us online, coming. They came and, and they checked out the school and they're like, oh my gosh, we, we're like in all these different days. and smells good and there's excellence here as God is growing this school. And I'm so excited, Patty, I see you back there, but I went to ZCA with her son, Evan. Uh, we were in the same class together all the way up through eighth grade and I'm so happy you're here and it's great to see you. Uh, but man, it's amazing, uh, just the even the alumni at ZCA, how it's a strong, I uh, mean, they're out changing the world, they're doing great things and uh, we're just excited of what God is doing in our school in this new season. Watch out for the pod on the side, by the way. We're pushing and moving a bunch of stuff. A bunch of stuff in there so we don't hit the pod. Just a disclaimer. But awesome. So we are talking out of Ephesians 6 this morning. We are concluding again our talk on spiritual warfare. This scripture came to me at the end of last service, and I just jotted it down. But it says this. It says, Psalms 34, 18 the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he rescues those whose spirits are crushed. I just felt to share that this morning at this service. I don't know who that's for, but if there's brokenness, if you feel that you just need the rescue of the Holy Spirit to come and touch you, know that he's close to you this morning and that he's with you and that you have victory in your life. But what's neat as we dive in <clears throat> to Ephesians 6, if you've been in this church for any amount of time or if you've been a believer this topic, the subject of spiritual warfare should be a basic, a 101 in your life. But the thing of how the enemy works and how life is built in seasons is the enemy always comes at strategic seasons of our life and is always wanting to oppress us, wanting to oppose us. Is there days you ever feel like just the, the fiery darts of the enemy are just coming down on you. They're all over you. It's all but to do of, of take that shield of faith and block them. That there's just times in our life when we can tell we are under a demonic attack. 
or very practically, we're just, there's just temptation in all places coming against us. And so Paul, last week we talked about marriage and we, we've talked about identity and, and Paul just gives us such great theology and great uh, the responsibility of how we walk out that theology in Ephesians. But what we're about to get into and what we just looked at last week of, of marriage and it was so thick we could cut the atmosphere in the room with a knife last week. I love those kind of messages because that means you're listening. And uh, it was just awesome when you look at, at marriage and the way God designed it, something that's tough, something that the reality of it we see is on a steep decline in our culture today, that when if we don't know how to fight, if we don't know how to engage in warfare for our families, our marriages, what God has burdened us with, then we're not going to accomplish and we're not going to see our lives look like what Scripture says if we don't know how to fight for it. And Paul tells us this is how you fight. Paul is acting as a commanding officer inspired by the Holy Spirit saying, hey, here's the instructions. Here is your strategy that in the Christian walk, in the Christian life, this is how you're to fight. Am I talking to any Christians this morning that you're thankful that you know how to fight in the Spirit? You know how to pray in the Spirit. You know how to engage in warfare. And so he gives us this language of putting on an armor. I want to read the scripture, allow Paul to pastor us here for a second, and just let it be a refresher to you this morning that wherever you find yourself, that you would know that you have weapons in your arsenal that you should and can be using. Here's what it says, Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. He says again, stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take your helmet of salvation and your sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may be, I may be able to speak boldly as I ought to speak. Skip down, verse 23 says this, Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you, all those who love our Lord Jesus in sincerity. Amen. It's a good prayer right there. So this is Paul's prayer to you, that you would know how to fight, that you can persevere. You would know that this armor is available. But if we don't armor up, if we don't wake up, uh, as Our Lady Life Church said this this year, wake, pray, slay, repeat. If we don't do that, then you're not going to be able to experience spiritual success in your life. Spiritual warfare has been a game changer in my life. There doesn't go a day when I, I when you sense temptation or you sense witchcraft coming against you that there's a way you can come up against that and push it off of your life. If you ever find yourself depressed, if you ever find yourself thinking thoughts or the enemy bringing up your past, usually you can find yourself in a demonic attack. Now, when we think of demonic attacks, we think it's this crazy stuff happening in the spirit or these wild dreams we have. Now, that does happen. But in reality, it's very practical. And if you can pick up on things, you can begin to come up against it, not against the person, the flesh and blood, but against the principality behind it, against the power behind it. You can take your sword of the spirit and go to the root of what's coming up against you. Anybody ever been in a spiritual attack? Is this a relevant word for you this morning? And so Paul is, is giving us these how-tos. You know, one thing we have to know in our Christian life and what we see Paul talk about so often in Scripture, in Corinthians and Philippians and in Ephesians, what we just read, 
is that war is a constant in our lives. It's Christians. We are enlisted as soldiers in a war. The enemy never goes on vacation. He never says, I work nine to five, and then you can have your peace with your family. Anybody ever had a demonic attack in the middle of the night? He loves to attack your sleep. He loves to make you wrestle in bed. He, he knows how to get to us. Sin, temptation, demonic attacks, as I've said before, always comes in a tailor-made suit with your name on it. The enemy's been around for thousands of years. He has studied the human race. He knows how to get to you. He knows how to slide in, to deceive, to pull you away, and to attack you. So God knows this. We know that the enemy is defeated, that the ultimate war is won. You read the book of Revelation. You know in the end we win. But God has put us here on earth to disarm and dismantle the works of the devil. Jesus even tells us in 1 John 3, 8, that we're to destroy the works of the devil. If you follow up on Mr. Wally Shubat's blog, he talks a lot about of how that is to be and what's going on in the world and how we're to destroy the works of the devil, that it's good versus evil, that we're on the good side. You have to pick a side in this fight and in this war. Are you on good or are you on evil? And us together, we are on the good side where we are destroying, we are fighting, we are on the offense and we are defending. We're like Nehemiah in the Bible. We're building and we're, we're wielding the sword of the spirit and we're building and advancing the kingdom of God. Man, I'm just excited this morning. Can we just thank God that we are advancing the kingdom of God this morning? that we know how to fight in the Spirit. We are victorious. And so a couple of points for you is we need to know our enemy. If we're going to be able to fight and you're going to be able to engage in the spiritual warfare, you have to know your enemy. We need to know, and this is basic, this is 101, Jesus loves us, Satan hates us. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves of that. That's why we love that song that he's good, because sometimes what we're going through, we have to declare and we have to remind ourselves of the promises of God, that he's always good. It's Satan who is always opposing us and coming up against us. He's not the bad one. Jesus isn't. It's our enemy. It's Satan. And because Satan couldn't overthrow God when when uh, God overthrew Satan, cast him out, and two-thirds of the demons of the legions, and now they're here on earth, what do they do? They oppose the thing closest to God, which is his people, which is his church. So that's why we experience spiritual warfare. That's why we experience demonic oppression. Because the enemy knows the closest thing to the heart of God is you and I. And so we need to know how to fight it. But first, we have to know our enemy. Again, Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle. I was picking fun at my grandma nanny, as she says, growing up, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Come on, who says wrestle? You're not ashamed. But it says against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So we see here, the fight is not flesh and blood. If I'm angry, it's Seth, or he's frustrating me, which doesn't happen, but it's usually something motivating that. And so you have to be able to step back and look at, at the big picture. Okay, why am I frustrated? Why am I agitated? Is, is there something bigger going on? So we have to know this, that under Satan's motivation, it's always pride. Satan's motivation, he's motivated by pride. That's why he wanted to overthrow God. It's because he was prideful. He thought he could do it better. He had a plan in place. And so every usually when you see pride raise its head, it's usually motivated not by God, but by Satan. Satan's the most prideful being in the history of creation, where God was so utterly humble that in Hebrews 4, it says that when he sent Jesus, Jesus walked this earth a sinless life, was tempted as we were, dealt with the same things we do, is so relatable with us, but never fell into sin. So Jesus gets us, and because he gets us, he wants to give us his strength, which is ultimately motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's why we see God in humility send his son and Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we can walk in this identity that we are victorious. You know, I'm convinced when you experience spiritual warfare, the first tactic the enemy will usually do is get your focus off. He'll get you off focus. He'll get you looking in a different direction. He'll get you out of church. He'll get you out of your word. He'll get worship music out of your mouth. He'll get praise out of you. He'll get you offended. He'll get you bitter. He'll get you gossiping to get you out 
of what is your flow and out of what motivates you, which is the Spirit of God. He wants to block that in your life. He wants to get you out of focus. And when he gets you out of focus, then he can take the next tactic and begin to get you and begin to come in in a second wave. And so this is what pride says, and this is what we have to watch that we don't say, is I don't need to listen to anyone. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to submit to anyone else. I can take care of myself. I don't need to follow someone else. I'm the authority in my own life. That's what pride says, and that's when we feel that, that we don't want to, that's why we were talking in marriage, man, that submission, that respect, that honor, that man loving and serving his wife, that has been under attack since the day of creation. That there's this battle of submission and respect and honor. But when we bring that into our home and we bring that into our lives, when you start to step into that, guess what? You're going to get attacked because the enemy doesn't want to see what can happen when that begins to take place. You know, the Bible and, and spiritual warfare talks about wrestling. I have two brothers. I know what it means to wrestle. Disclaimer, I would always win our wrestling battles. I got 20 pounds on clay. Many of you can't see it, but it's there, all right? And as the older brother, there would sometimes be times of pride in my life where I cannot lose to my younger brother, Cole. I cannot lose to Clay. 11 months apart, man. A lot of competition in our house. Wait till you see us on the golf course. It's a lot of fun. But when I was thinking about wrestling and times that we've wrestled and there's times when you get with your friends and you wrestle, you turn on an MMA fight and you see the intensity that they wrestle, is what's known as, as wrestling in the clinch where it's hand-to-hand, -hand, it's close combat, that that's really what the Christian life looks like, that we have the enemy in the clinch, and he's trying to put us in the clinch, and we're resisting him. Me and Steve were talking after a second service scripture that says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. When you keep resisting him and the strength of the Holy Spirit's empowering you, guess what? You're going to be able to throw him off and move forward and not allow him to take you down. There's power that can come behind you when you resist. When you don't just take what, what he throws your way. And so we need to know our enemy. We need to know his tactics. Let me tell you, growing a family, growing a church, growing a ministry, growing what God has put in your hands never comes without a cost. There's always a cost associated to it. And I would be lying to you if I would tell you that this place of standing here in front of you is easy and is a cakewalk. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. But I know that there is an anointing and that there is a spiritual, a spiritual empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do it. That when you get out of your comfort zone, as I do every week, and trust God, he shows up. And he'll show up in your life and he'll show up in your family when you get out of the way and just allow him to do what he wants to do. He wants to use you. Be humble and allow him to do it. When you think of Jesus and his ministry and what he did, you know, there's times Jesus was exhausted there's times Jesus, I am thought, how are we going to get the finances or the money to fund this missionary journey? There was times where Jesus was, how is this going to happen? How is this going to work? How is the school going to grow? How are we going to make two services work? All these things that just, in my world, what goes through my head, how are you going to pay the bills? How are you going to tithe? All these things that we deal with on a daily basis. But there's something in what Jesus' secret was to confronting the enemy, confronting the mental attacks that would say, you, you can't do this, you can't move this forward, the opposition is too great. Guess what? Praise is your weapon. Worship is your weapon. And when you begin to talk it, you begin to think it, and then you begin to walk it. And you can begin to see things change in your life. So you have to know your enemy and know that you're in the clinch and know that you're in this fight with him. Again, the enemy never goes on vacation. We would like to think that we could just, God, just give me a break. But it's usually when we say that is when he takes a foothold. Number two, if you're taking notes, is we have to know our king. I love what this says. If we do not know who we fight for, we are not going to fight well. If you don't know your king, if you don't know who you're fighting for, if you don't know the price he paid for you, the, the love that he has for you, the joy that he wants to give you. If you don't know what you're fighting for, that we're the church militant, that we are advancing the kingdom of God, then you're not going to fight well. You're not going to see the importance of this message. You're not going to see the importance of spiritual warfare. Again, what Paul says, he says, finally, my brethren, 
be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not by our might, not by our power, but by his spirit. Lean in and find your strength in him. If we don't know who we're fighting for, we're not going to fight well. That's why you can't ever underestimate getting to know the word of God, getting to know what he thinks about you. That's what Ephesians 1 through 3, read those books, meditate on them, get to know how God sees you, how he feels about you, that he's not angry at you, that he can't wait for you to mess up and kick you out of the way, but that he is a healer. He looks, he is attracted to brokenness. He is close to the brokenhearted and wants to come and fix it and engage in your life and help you with what you're going through, set you free of what you're going through. So when knowing our king, the thing I love when we fight for him, he gets the glory and we get the joy. You ever had the joy of seeing on the other side of a spiritual attack when God begins to move and you see him working? There was probably 50 times you could step in and get and do what you feel is right or what you feel in your flesh. But man, when you get over here and you just begin to pray, you begin to, to, to do what's right, follow the word of God, you're patient. Usually spiritual warfare takes patience. And then you start to look over, you see God moving. He's moving in you, he's moving in that situation and God's going to work on your behalf. It's amazing. But so many times we want to jump in front of it and not know the heart that Jesus doesn't want to destroy that person as much as he doesn't want to destroy you, but is working on that person as much as he's working on you. It takes patience, though. So God wants us to know his heart, to know our king, to know our enemy, how he works and what he does. You know, you might have had a struggle getting to church this morning. It wasn't because you're going to church. It's because you're stepping into warfare. Every time you walk through those doors and you see the cross, you step into the sanctuary, it should reorient your thinking, your being into, I'm not just getting a cup of coffee. I am stepping in to something that's holy. I am stepping in to this community, to this family. I am getting recharged. I am getting ready for battle. And it should reorient your thinking. It should change something. Something should shift when you walk into a place like the house of God. You know, I heard it said that when it comes to worship and the word of how it works together is worship is like the anesthesia that, that kind of calms you and, and, and puts you in a place. The presence of God just is like hugging you and loving you and you're experiencing Christ. And then when the word comes, it's like that drill going into your mouth, filling that cavity, fixing what needs to be fixed. But because of the presence of God, it takes that pain where you're just not wanting to get up out of your chair and run out. And so without the presence of God and spiritual warfare, it doesn't work. Without you leaning into him, getting being filled with the Holy Spirit, when you see what's at task and the war at hand, it can make you, I, 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 don't, I can't do this. I don't have what it takes. But when you have the presence of God, that's where things begin to change. Number three, if you're taking notes, is we need to know our weapons. Aren't you thankful you have weapons at your disposal? How are we to use these weapons? How are we to take them up? How are we to fight with them? We know it's not flesh and blood again, but what scripture says is the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violence take it by force. How would you take it by force? You're persevering. You're staying in the fight. You're not running when it gets hard, but you are running to the front lines. You're serving, you're doing, you're staying connected. You're not disconnecting. You're not putting walls up with people, but you're staying in the fight. You're loving like you've never been hurt before. Verse 13 says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. We got to put it on that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We are a soldier that stands on our post. We don't weary. We don't get distracted. We stand on our post and we combat the enemy's tactics. So I want you to punch some of these in. If you're new to Christianity, these are what weapons are given to you and what we see through Ephesians chapter six. So write these down and begin to pray it. Bree and I, so many of you, if you've grown up in this church, you wake up and you put on your armor. It's amazing. It's something we instill uh, as early as kindergarten here at our church or here at our school where they put on their armor every day and they get ready for warfare. And so it's pretty neat is our GPC kids are in a series on 
the armor of God as well. So, man, there, this, a lot of armor talk is happening right now. But number one, what we see, what weapon you have is you have the belt of truth. Truth always exposes the lie. When you get the word of God, you are going to be able to expose lies around you. When you hear things, when you see things, you're going to be able to expose lies because you are tightening every day your belt of truth. Satan lies all the time. In the book Gospel of John, it refers to him as what? The father of lies. So everything that comes out of his mouth, he is a father of lies. I love what this says too, that Satan knows something doesn't need to be true, but all it has to do is be believed. You ever experienced that before? He's trying to twist something that's not even true. All he cares about is that you believe it. Maybe you deal with just conspiracy theories or, oh my gosh, is someone thinking against me or working against me? There's times where you just have to take and say, no, that's not the truth. And you have to take authority over it. Just tighten your belt of truth. Something I do uh, regularly and that really built a foundation of getting truth in my life, and I encourage you to do, if you go through this in a season of your life, is you draw a line and you'll see in your notes there's a place for you to do this later. And you put truth and you put lies. And on the lie side, you put the lies that have been spoken over you, the lies that you've believed. And then on truth, you put the truth of God's word on that side. And then that truth wages war on those lies. And then things begin to change and you stop believing the lies and you start believing the truth of God's word, who he says you are, what you can do, what his heart for you is. You gotta get the truth of God's word in you if you're gonna be successful at all in engaging against the enemy. We live in a world full of fake news and it, it's packed in a way where it's so easy to believe because of how well put it is together or how well it sounds. In the end times, deception will always run rampant. So when you get the truth in you, you're going to be able to not be deceived by the deception of the enemy. You know, we had a week in uh, our culture that uh, two prominent celebrities committed suicide. And you see this strand of suicide beginning to happen. There's even this documentary on uh, Netflix, which is, is one of the top 10 most viewed documentaries. And it's all about a girl committing suicide and writing these tapes of, of why she did it and, uh, and the after effect of it where it just intrigued a lot of people to suicide, that this could be an answer. You know, when you think of a culture that deals, that we're seeing suicide as an answer and this mental uh, health and this mental illness, and we see with uh, Anthony Bourdain, I believe his name is, the guy who does all the weird eats and stuff. It's an awesome show. Anybody ever watch that show? It's a fun show. Uh, and then we had uh, Kate Spade who committed suicide and had a 13-year-old daughter left behind her and, and the note that she left and some of the things she said in it. And I was just kind of reading up on the stories. And it's amazing because Anthony Bourdain would tell friends and those around him that one of the reasons he fell into depression was after his divorce and can never really shake himself out of it. And Kate Spade, one of the things that brought her to this final place, and she kind of had a, a track record of mental health and mental illness, is that there was talk of her and her husband separating and divorce was on the loom. And as we talked about marriage last week, I'm telling you that marriage and relationships can have a great effect on our life with the decisions we make and the brokenness that we experience and what do we do with it. But we need to know and we need the truth of God's word to, to stream into our society and stream out of our churches that suicide is never the answer. And I pray that a spirit of suicide would never touch you, never touch this church. If you're depressed, that you would not allow yourself to go there because you have purpose and you have destiny and you have hope in your life and taking your life is never the answer. And if you struggle with that, please see me, see someone, and we'll talk with you through it and give you truth. But that's the importance of tightening our belt of truth. He doesn't need it to be true. He just needs you to believe it. And he'll pack and he'll stack your life with things that aren't true if you can't discern it. You know, we're not responsible for the lies that come our way, but what we are responsible for is how we respond to them. Lies always lead us to dark places and put us into bondage. And that takes us into our second one is the breastplate of righteousness. When you think of a breastplate, it protects your important organs. It protects your heart. Proverbs says that above all else, guard your heart. For out of it flows 
the issues of life. How do we fight temptation? We fight it with the righteousness of Christ in us. You know, a lie that the enemy will tell you to, to get you further into sin is that if you're tempted, you're guilty. If you're tempted, you're guilty. He wants you to believe just because there's temptation, you haven't taken the bait of Satan yet, but that if the bait's there and you're tempted, oh my gosh, you're guilty, so you might as well just follow through with it. But if you can discern it and understand that no matter what age you are in life, where you find yourself, there will always be temptation. It's just when we take the bait is when we cross the line. And so when we're putting on the righteousness of Christ, we're going to be able to stand strong and we're going to be able to say no to temptation. And so the enemy will always tell you to get you down that slippery slope is that, hey, you're tempted. You might as well just go in and take it. Take the bait. But understand that when temptation faces you, that's when you engage in spiritual warfare and that's when you fight it. That's when you get the upper hand and that's when you begin to wield your sword of the spirit. You put up your shield of faith. You extinguish the fiery darts of that temptation and then you take the word and man, you attack that thing and you kill that temptation. That's how you fight. Put on your breastplate of righteousness. Number three is the boots of the gospel. Shoes of the gospel. You know, I think in, in a, through the mindset, boots, you know, my grandpa was a farmer. My dad was a waterproofer. They grew up in boots. I grew up in boots. Boots are just, you learn a lot when you wear boots a lot. You work hard. You, you are usually steel toe boots, man. You're protecting your feet because you're out in the trenches. You're working hard. You're doing things. And when you think in a military uh, setting, that soldiers who are on combat, when they go to sleep, they're not going to take their boots off because they got to be ready at all times. When the enemy just, you know, isn't going to attack because it's dark out. They have to be ready to get up, get their stuff, and go. The same is with us. We have to keep the boots of the good news on, being ready at all times to fight. Don't take a vacation from fighting. Stay in the fight. We always have to be ready. Ministry is warfare. Satan is always attacking. We sleep with our boots on. Number four is the shield of faith. You know, Jesus said in his mission statement when he rolled the scroll out in Isaiah and he fulfilled the prophecy, one of the lines of what he said of what his mission was is that he was to set captives free. Those outside of Christianity are captives. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with Jesus and are on mission, guess what? We take Christ and we go and share the good news to set those captives free. And so what happens is captivity can creep up around you if you don't know your identity. And so he gives us this shield of faith that when, if you picture, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan or you love sci-fi stuff, this stuff is displayed greatly in these movies. I had a friend who made me stick through a Lord of the Rings marathon, and it was probably the toughest 10 hours of my life. But I did it for him. So he gives us, any Lord of the Rings fans, by the way, you love Lord of the Rings, you're unashamed, all right, God bless you. We'll pray for you after church. No, you're good. So you, that shield of faith, when you think about it, how the scripture says it extinguishes the fiery darts. You know, there's this imagery you see in these movies where the... Uh, those with the bow and arrow are shooting it off and there are these arrows full of flames and they take those shields and they, they quench the fiery darts. And commentary will tell you that before they would go into battle, they would take their shields and run them in the river and get them sopping and soaked wet so when the arrows would hit those shields, those darts would be extinguished. And so what I want you to know and see out of that is many times the enemy will use accusations to haunt you and to bring fiery darts. He will bring up things in your past. He will bring up things that Jesus has already healed you from, set you free from, but continually accuse you to keep you bound. And so when those accusations come from the enemy, you get that shield out and you quench those accusations and they're not gonna touch you and they're not gonna define you. Use your shield of faith. Number five is the helmet of salvation. How many of you know it's so important to protect your head, protect your mind, concussions, all these things. Protect mentally what you read, what you watch, what you listen to. Your mind is, is a place of decision-making. 
and the enemy wants to rattle you, he wants to attack you in your mind because the battlefield always begins and always starts in your mind. The enemy can get you thinking a certain way, then he can begin to get you acting a certain way. So you need to know how to fight the enemy in your mind. There's great resources and things we can get you if you deal with just constant warfare in your mind. Number six is we take the sword of the Spirit. This is one of my favorite weapons in the arsenal that's given to us. Is Satan, when you know you're in a spiritual attack, will always try to get the sword out of your hand. He'll keep you out of church. He'll keep you out of the word. He'll keep you out of community because he knows this is how you fight him. This is how you keep him. This is how you kill him. This is how you fight the sin in your life. He wants to keep the sword of the spirit out of your hand. You know, if I were to draw a gun at you, that would be an act of war against you. The same as what we do with Satan. When we pull our word out, word out, we are waging war on the enemy. Pull it out of your holster, use it, speak it, live it, walk it, submit to it, and watch it literally change your life. We're in a war. Use your sword of the spirit. This is how we advance the kingdom. This is how you advance your family. This is how you break through as you use the sword of the spirit. Number seven is praying in the spirit. Aren't you thankful God's given us a prayer language? He's given us communication with God. Any effective battle plan, soldiers would never be deployed without a proper line of communication. The Holy Spirit gives us that communication. He gives us a way when we spend time with him and we lean in, we tell him, hey, this is what's going on. This is what's on our heart. But then we listen to him and he'll speak to us through his written word. He'll speak to us and say, this is what I want you to do or this is what I want you to bless today. This is where I want you to go today. Spend time and get your wisdom, get your instruction from the Holy Spirit and pray in the Spirit. Pray and strengthen yourself in the Holy Spirit. You gotta ask yourself, how is your prayer life? You gotta lean in and find instruction from the Holy Spirit. Communicate with God. Aren't you thankful we have a relationship with God that we can communicate with him? We can hear from him. And number eight, I want the team to come this morning and they're gonna just lead us in a time of worship here. And we're just gonna seal the deal of spiritual warfare in our lives is perseverance. Number eight is perseverance. Nothing will ever be accomplished in your life spiritually or physically unless you're willing to to persevere, persevere, unless you're willing to hang in there, unless you're willing to hold the line. You know, I know my job as a husband and as a soon-to-be dad is to stand in my post and is to persevere and fight for my family. My job as your pastor is to persevere and stand here and bring the uncompromised word of God and fight for you and fight for this church and fight for this school and make sure that you're getting equipped with what you need in order to fight. Persevere. Don't tap out. Don't go running the other way when it gets tough. We have to persevere. Jesus persevered for us, and it's his strength given to us that we have the ability to persevere. You know, I was we were celebrating uh, Caleb and McKenzie. They had their year anniversary, but Tuesday I figured out that Steve and Sandy, our elders here, were celebrating 47 years of marriage. Now that's perseverance, and there's a lot to learn there. There's something powerful when you persevere in a marriage, when you persevere in the relationships in your family and your life, you do things out of the ordinary. You fight for one another. You know, if we're a church that fights for one another, there will be nothing that we can't do because the unity is that's there. You go on and you read the, the blessing that Paul leaves. He blesses us with grace and he blesses us uh, with love. And what we see out of that is that many times, or he blesses us with peace, not love, I'm sorry. He does bless us with love, but in this situation, it's peace. Is that so many times in churches or in families, soldiers will get out of focus and they'll begin to turn their weapon on one another. And they begin sparring with one another. You gotta remember, we're on the same team. We're going after the same thing. And if the enemy can bring confusion in the camp, man, he's got you. He's got you pitted against each other. You're not gonna move forward. You're not going to see things healed in your life. But that's where you have to understand 
that don't look at the person and saying, they're the one causing this offense or they're the one that's doing this, so I'm going to physically fight them back. No, there's something so much greater going on. You have to discern in the Spirit and get with the Holy Spirit and get instruction. Talk to Him, and He will talk back, and He'll show you how to walk through it. It works. And so this morning, I want the Holy Spirit to strengthen you. Whatever season you find yourself in, wherever you find yourself or what spiritual warfare you're dealing with, Let's ask the Holy Spirit for strength. Anybody need strength this morning in your walk? You need strength this morning in your fight. You don't do it alone. You lean into him. And I guarantee you, before you leave this morning, God will strengthen you. You have to open up your heart. Ask him. Let's put on our armor. When you walk out of here and when you wake up every morning from here on out, put on your armor and watch as things begin to change. There's days we forget to pray and we're like, why are we in a funk today? She's like, well, did we pray? I'm like, that was probably it. So there's power when you make a commitment that I'm going to pray this way, I'm going to fight this way, and I'm going to trust what the Word of God says. If you would stand to your feet this morning, I want to pray for you. Close your eyes. I want you just to ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what areas in this fight do I need to be strengthened What areas in this fight? Maybe I don't know my enemy. Maybe I don't know his strategies. Maybe I've forgot about the goodness of God or what his heart is for me. Maybe I don't know my king like I'm forgetting. I'm, I'm, I'm losing sight. I'm losing focus. Maybe I'm not taking up the weapon or maybe I'm leaving out a piece of the armor I'm not putting on because I've been hurt or because there's struggle in my life or maybe it's just too heavy to carry right now. God, I ask you right now, whatever that may be, that we would know our enemy, we would know our king, and we would know our weapons. That we would be protected and shielded in all areas of our body, in all areas of our life. We ask you right now, Holy Spirit, to strengthen us. And here in a minute, as we sing, as we declare we are victorious, that we're not slaves to fear, we're not going to fear the fight, we're not going to fear the battle. But God, we are going to run to the battle. We are going to be on the offensive. We are going to stop it before it even starts. I pray that strategy would fill this room in the name of Jesus, that we would be no longer slaves. I pray for your people. And I pray that you would encounter us as we sing, as we know that we are victorious this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. This is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to get in the way of your praise, but not this morning, because what he spoke was so much truth. And so we're going to proclaim that in the name of Jesus, that we are no longer slaves, and that he split the sea for us. And so Seth, I believe that was a spiritual thing, if it didn't happen before. So I want you, as you sing this, as you just sing it from a place that just is speaking to us. songs of deliverance we've been liberated from our bondage we're the sons and the daughters
I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Yeah, I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a There's a part of the service where we want to give an opportunity. Maybe you've never done that. You've never built your life on the firm foundation. The Bible talks about that either we build our life on the rock, who's Jesus Christ, or we build our life on quicksand, sinking sand. As believers, we want to build our life on the rock. Maybe you've never had a moment, or maybe you've fallen from God. Maybe your rock has crumbled and situations and things have happened in your life where you haven't built the rock around you or built yourself on the rock. 
If you've never said, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life, or maybe you need to recommit yourself to Christ and, and begin building again because building and fighting and warring never stops. But you're not in it alone. Jesus wants to strengthen you and wants to put his life in you. And so if that's you this morning, it's real simple. It starts with a prayer, a confession of your sin, and you invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. He forgives it. He cleans the slate, and then he puts his spirit in you and sets you off and begins building your life on the rock. If you've never made that decision here, I just want you to raise your hand that you want Jesus to be Lord of your life. Or if you want to recommit your life to Jesus right here and right now, we want to give you that opportunity. Amen. God bless you. I see your hand. Is there anyone else? You want this to be a moment that you dedicate your life to Jesus. Don't let this moment pass. The Spirit of God is doing something powerful here. He wants to heal you. He wants to set you free. He wants to deliver you. Thank you, Jesus. I want to pray with you. I want you to come right here. Come here. You guys come together. God's doing powerful things in your life. And we're so proud of you. Can we welcome her? I just want to take a moment and I want to pray with you, okay? Father, I thank just do that one more time with all the voices and allow this to be our anthem this morning as we take the fight out of the house you go back into your homes you go back into your workplace you're going to be met with resistance with opposition but no you have a king who's fighting for you and who loves you so let's lift our hands and let's declare this one more time this morning in the name of jesus we thank you thank you jesus and i will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those Amen. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you've sealed this moment, that we are victorious. Can we now put our hands together and thank him that we serve a king who's won it all for us, who's made a way that when you leave here today, know that the battle is shifted in your favor. Know that you have weapons to pull. Know that you are renewed by the power of the Holy Spirit and that great things are ahead because you walk in the victory of Christ.
In Jesus' name, you can be seated. Awesome. Well, we're just going to take a moment and jump right into our giving. You know, what's neat about times of war, you look at the culture of America in World War II, that everyone just began to sacrifice for the cause of the war, to win the war, that businesses, families, things begin to put their money, put their resources to fund the war. When you give, when you tithe, when you give above your tithe and you give an offering, or maybe you sacrifice and send your kids here to the school, guess what? You are giving to fund the war. You're giving to fund the good versus evil. You're giving to to advance the kingdom of God. Aren't you thankful that you're a part of the kingdom of God this morning, that you give to advance the kingdom? You know, God has blessed this house. It's completely debt-free, so we're able to hone in and build and move forward. We're not bound by debt in this house, but we're bound by freedom, and we're bound We're bound by the Spirit of God, and we want to be led by the Spirit of God, and we want to stand under his authority and do what he's called us to do, and that's advance the kingdom of God. And we do that when we give, when we serve, when we jump in and we're on the front lines. So this morning as the ushers come, we also have an opportunity to give uh, toward our youth ministry. Uh, So we're going to do two offerings right here in this offering. So if you uh, want to sponsor, we're sending our students on June 28th to Ford Conference, which is a powerful conference. It's three days, and uh, we have about eight kids going. And some of these kids are in a tough place financially to be able to afford their ticket. So if you would like just to sponsor maybe $10, $20 to help us get our youth group to Atlanta for this powerful conference, feel free to do that now. You can write on your envelope just Ford Conference, or you can Um, write a check to Ford Conference, or later in the day, you can just go and you can text it in. You can go on your app and you can give and just put Ford Conference. And we're going to make sure that these kids get to Ford Conference. It's going to be awesome. But I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for how generous you are, how you love this house, how you support this house. And great things truly are ahead as we move forward, as we build, and as we see all that God wants to do accomplished here. We're all in this together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word this morning. We thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for salvation. God, we thank you that you get the glory and you put your joy in us and the joy of the Lord is our strength. It is an honor to give. It's an honor to fund the mission, to fund what you're doing in the kingdom. God, that we get to play a part of it, that we invest into it. And you've blessed us with a wonderful house you bless us with a wonderful church. We see in the book of Haggai, when we take care, care of your house, you take care of ours. We rest on that promise, and we thank you that you're a mighty, powerful, working God. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Awesome. Well, Bree, you want to share a little bit of what's going on here in the next few weeks? Yeah, you can cue the single ladies music if you know the dance. Doing that. But we're going to have a single ladies um, bowling night. Miss Loretta is going to be uh, taking that over. And the time is 6 p.m. And that's at the Florence Bowl. It's going to be a good time. I heard maybe Frisch's after. Who knows? Who knows? You guys just go have fun. Do whatever the heck you want to do within reason. But um, no, so Keep we're it PG. PG. Um, but we're excited about that. Um, and speaking of the app, I loved taking notes today. Great. In the app. It was so easy, so convenient. Awesome. Did everybody else take notes from the app? Nice. Isn't that awesome. Good. I don't know. Maybe I just, I love it. Oh, so good. it was such a great way, but I think we have a video. So yeah, if you haven't downloaded it yet, here's a little bit of what it looks like. So it's available Android, Google phone, iPhone. Make sure you jump on there and grab it uh, as we'll be uploading notes every week and sermons, messages you can give. You can watch live out of town. By the way, we love you online church as you're watching in. 
great service today. Pam and Scott, I'm sure you're watching today somewhere in sunny Florida. Oh, they, oh she misses us. She's texting us. Awesome. No, we love the app, and I think it's going to be such an incredible tool. All of the events, the registration, different things like that. So I'm great. excited. Awesome. And last but not least, if it's your first time here, uh, we'd love to connect with you. We have a gift for you in the back. Please go see the awesome Michelle and Troy. Troy, her husband, is jumping in today and helping. Uh, but we'd love to see you get you a gift. Uh, there's a card on the seat back in front of you. Just jot your name and a phone number down. We want to call you this week and just connect with you, hear your story, hear how we can pray with you. Uh, but we'd love to get to know you. Don't forget your gift on the way out. And uh, with that, let's stand and we will pray. And uh, you'll be dismissed this morning. Hasn't it been good this morning? You've been blessed. Feel strengthened. Awesome. Let's lift our hands. Father, we thank you for what you've done in the house. We pray your rich blessing upon us. We thank you that we are rich in Christ. We're called, we're saved, we're chosen. We are victorious, God, that you're at work in each and every one of us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Empower us to do the work of the ministry as we leave here today. We love you, Lord. Bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen.